On today's show, Stephen and Evan Strong, a father and son team of Australian researchers and authors from New South Wales. Their ForgottenOrigin.com website details anomalous artefacts and evidence of very ancient civilizations in Australia. Their theories and evidence throw into question the Out of Africa theory and they state that an ancient culture could have come out of Australia up to 400,000 years ago. The intrepid pair were recently featured in the UK's Daily Mail. The story describes how a teacher, Richard Patterson from New South Wales, came across letters from Australian author and researcher Frederick Slater of the Archaeological Educational Research Society, which date back to Slater's research in the 30s and 40s. An ancient stone circle which originally contained 185 stones was discovered 40 kilometres from Mullumbimby in New South Wales. Slater believed that markings on the stones were of an ancient language. Stephen and Evan are putting this and much other research together. Predictably they have had a tough time from academics. They consult with tribal elders and collaborate with other researchers in their quest to piece together the ancient history which has been written out of the conventional timeline. The mission statement on their website reads, Our main brief is to prove through scientific fact that which the elders insist is true. We have assembled facts about archaeological finds, early contact accounts, genetics, serpent myths, dreaming stories, American Indian myths, parallels in religious texts, etc. into one coherent theory. Now, Stephen is here with me today and we're going to be talking to him for the next hour about ancient Australia. So Stephen, welcome to Windows on the World. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here Mark and lovely to talk to you again. Well it's been quite a while and first let's go briefly into the background of how you started looking into ancient Australia. Okay well to begin with I had nothing to do with writing or in history at all. I was a teacher um, and I was involved in teaching the original studies in New South Wales. I was involved with the Department of Education in setting it up. And what happened over a period of time is I was teaching the course of, uh, to the, the children and um, I got on well with the children. And then the adults felt comfortable with us, or with me particularly at that time. And slowly but surely, they started to show us the real truth, not the one that we've been researching in books, and it became quite apparent that what was being taught to the children was a lie. It wasn't the truth. And that started to worry me a fair bit. And then further down the line, the AB Studies course that we set up had been hijacked by historians and turned it into something quite distasteful. And they called us back together to sort of look at the course in Sydney. And when I went down there, I realized I was sitting next to 22 history teachers plus myself, and I realized they were turning a blackfellas story into a whitefellas story, and it became obvious to me that we couldn't stay in the Department of Education anymore because they had taken the truth and turned it and manufactured it and turned it back into something that really was an appalling effort and an insult to the culture and the old ways. So we decided... Since the department wouldn't take our research, because by that stage we worked out that most of the stuff they were teaching was wrong, we had the choice of sitting, you know, taking the money, working in the schools and teaching the lies, or walk away from the Department of Education and put out the truth. So that's what we did. We decided that wasn't going to work. So that was our base. And then very soon after, we wrote a couple of books for University Press of America, very sanitized, I've got to be honest, because we weren't being too controversial. And the Ram and Jerry, a, a tribe that really lived the old way, they called me down and gave me ceremony. And from that point on, we were under a new, um, a new regime. And we were answerable solely to the original people, because once you're given ceremony, you are answerable to them in everything you do. And that set us off onto a completely new course and we walked away from the Department of Education and Mainstream and have wandered off into the truth from that point on. It's really wow. interesting because a lot of these ancient civilizations depended on an oral culture mm. and if I could maybe compare it to like Druidic culture 
um, which I'm not I'm not obviously comparing your Aboriginal culture in Australia to that but what the oral culture is about is really the keeping alive of knowledge and within these communities it appears that truth was paramount in the passing down of these stories so in a way they are much more reliable once you start looking into it have you found that is this something that you you would agree with or or would you say that there's myth and legend thrown in as well no i actually think you're much closer to the truth people have often said that oral traditions are faulty and they often use that Chinese whispers, which I think is quite a racist comment, but they use that particular thing where a story is passed from one person to another and it slowly changes. And we've done this as kids. Sometimes in the school you'll sit around with a group and they'll pass a story on and when it gets to the end, it's not there, it's a different story and everyone says, oh, well, we can't rely on that. But that's not right. It's not right for two different reasons. Number one, in Australia, this is the only continent on the planet where nobody is allowed to invade or walk upon another person's country. Now, this is very important, Mark, because it changes the parameters of each society. What it means is, yes, the original people fought on tribal agreed ground, but they would never go back if they lost. The other tribe would not walk onto their land and take the children, rape the women and steal the goods and chattels. They're not allowed to. So that means that each tribal boundary is untouched by an invading group that comes in and insanitizes the truth to justify their faults and their lies. Here, it means that the, the morals, the stories and the dreaming accounts and ceremonies remain untouched because it is against the law for you to go onto another country. There are spirits there you do not know and they will kill you. They will harm you because you're on that country and you can't fight them and your elders and your clever fellows do not know how to do, do with these elders, these spirits, because they don't know them. So what it means is that the, the oral tradition is then, therefore, it's got an integrity that you're not going to find in other continents. And secondly, you've got to remember that all of the initiation ceremonies come down to memorization of story. Now, I watched a story about probably the greatest traditional artist in Australia called Clifford Possum Japuljara, and he's a stunning artist. Some of his works hold for over a million dollars. But if you watch a film of him painting, his cousin stands above him and directs every dot. No, you can't put it there. It must go there. No, that mark must go there. There is a tradition, even in the way they paint, that they rely on past uh, a precedent. So nothing changes. So what we have there is the proper history, where if you got one word wrong, you've lost your ceremony. You can't go up a level. You've got to learn that word again until you get it right. So there's an integrity in the legends and myths that we call legends and myths that we'll never fully understand. Now, the dreaming is quite interesting because the truth will be presented in a story, but it could be multi-layered. And you may find to begin with, and this is why people get confused, there'll be a level that is given to the children. And, of course, that's what white fellas have got from dreaming stories. They've got the first level, and they think, oh, well, this sounds like a charming little fairy tale. Of course it isn't true, because these things couldn't happen. Yes, at that level, they're not supposed to know the truth, and that's why the white fellas get that version. But when you get further down and you learn more and you learn the language and the symbolism, then you start to delve in to find the deeper truths. And that's what we found about the dreaming and their history. It is multi-layered and it's incredibly, incredibly intelligent. And you don't get there in bits and pieces. I've been given ceremony and my elders would give me a little bit of information each time. I was never allowed to ask a question because I'd never get an answer. They don't do it like that. They give the information to someone when they're ready and deserving of it. So what that means is there's such an integrity, not only in keeping the truth, but only giving information to a person where they're capable of understanding it and fully appreciating it. 
So you're not going to get some fool that didn't quite understand what was going on and passed it on to the next generation and then mistakes happen because he didn't quite get it or she didn't get it. She can only pass it on when she's passed every test and that'll include cuts, long periods on your own to learn this information. It is all they live for, to learn this knowledge. So you've got a different parameter within here that means basically if I'm talking to an elder of the old way, I have never, never questioned what they've said. Sometimes they've told me things where I've walked away and thought, oh, my God, how are we going to prove that? And lo, lo and lo and behold, down the line, we stumble into a piece of evidence and I think to myself, why did I even question the fact that we'd have a problem finding it? We always do. Well, that's really interesting because the thing is that there's a huge difference between real knowledge and just repeating something. So what you've done there is separate the two. You were in the education system of repetition. And oh, yes. comes from the repetition. But knowledge is something completely different. And that's something that a lot of people seem to have a problem with even understanding now. Well, knowledge is the pathway for your own salvation. And if you're going to get knowledge, the difference is in original society to get your own knowledge. This is different to other cultures where you go into a church or you memorize something. You find it yourself. That's the whole culture here that when you go off into the dreaming, when you've been given your cuts, you'll wander off into the bush for months. Now, there'll be an uncle watching you from a distance and they'll be keeping an eye on you, but they will not be standing there saying, this is what you've got to do next. And each of these novices then goes out to find the spirits. Now, the interesting part of this equation is they expect to find the spirits and the spirits will make contact with them. And that is part of the way they live. Now, I've been with elders who actually can disappear in front of your eyes. Now, I know some people are going to shake, shrug and say, you've got to be joking. No, because if you think I'm lying, talk to Graham Hancock, because he was with Kana when he disappeared in front of both of our eyes. If you want to call me a liar, you've got to call Graham one too. And there were eight other people there when it happened. Now that, that truth of disappearing or talking with animals, and I could spend days talking about what the elders don't do today, that is where humanity should be. But instead, we're somewhere completely different and working further away from the truths that the elders have. Yeah, we've been taken away from it. That's very, very interesting that what you've just said, because I've experienced a similar thing myself. And we're talking about really tuning into multidimensional things here. That's we've gone quite profound already. And um, th this is the difference between this surface knowledge that we're given and real knowledge. So I think that's a really, really good introduction, Stephen. We're going to take a short break. We'll be back in a couple of minutes. Instead of being the youngest race, we now have an equal with the Africans. And the argument is now which came first. Now, the only reason why the researchers, the Danish researchers said the Africans, they said, well, they must have because we know the, Afri the original people only got to Australia 50,000 years ago. Well, I was so wrong on that point. There are six different sites, sorry, 10 sites in Australia that are over 50,000 years. And, and only one of them has to be right to pull that into question. There is a story here that goes back much further than anywhere else. Welcome back to Windows on the World. I'm talking to Stephen Strong about ancient Australia and it's very fascinating. We're now going to talk about sort of artifacts that have been found which are very anomalous and evidence of an ancient culture in Australia and really what we're being told the conventional story and the differences between that. So welcome back, Stephen. Oh, pleasure to be here, Mark. Well, it's great talking because it's been a while since we actually went into any depth on things and you've, you've been doing tremendous work over the past couple of years. But just to for people who are new to to this, oh. um, this idea of the ancient Australia, can you just... Um, Give us some 
a few examples of these ancient artifacts. We have discussed quite a few of them on the show. And, yeah, and the evidence you said, that you've been like, looking into. Uh, well, look, there's, there's probably about a, a, a tally of about 60 to choose from, to be honest. It's quite amazing. I remember Graham came across here and he said, how come you can have so much stuff here? And the answer is simple. is because no one else does it. So we get all of it. But the two that... The two that have actually had the most cred overseas would probably be the Standing Stone site and, of course, the Carry-On Glyphs. I suppose in one respect the Carry-On Glyphs are an easy way to start this story because they're not subtle. There's no nuances there. It's in your face. When you get to these walls, you look at it straight away and everyone who's been there says, my God, what have we got here? What we actually have uh, near a place called Gosford is we have three walls that have had that have got ancient engravings carved into them. Now, look, I know for an absolute fact the government have tried their hardest to lie about this, and I know that the lies are coming, falling apart. And I know that they said that one stage a group of students from Sydney Uni in the 1960s went out into the bush and went out with a lecturer, and then they just decided to, being prospective archaeological students, they decided to create a fake to do something unprofessional, all of them together, and to make up archaeology. Wonderful concept, I thought, from Sydney Uni, to take students out before they come archaeology and teach them how to cheat. That's the claim. But we went into this in more detail and we found, number one, there's no name given. And number two, Sydney Uni have never taught Egyptian hieroglyphs or archaeology. So my question is, where did they get the kiddies from to do this? And, of course, all these students, not once, when they've partied on late at night, have they ever said, we did it, we've got no name. But then again, don't worry, there's another story about a deranged Czech who was intellectually retarded and he was found walking through there in a chisel, with a chisel in his hand, no hammer, in 1975, but no name again. Look, they've done many of those. We've got step decks from four people. They've seen the glyphs and one was in the 1950s. It is a legitimate set of glyphs. Make no bones about it. It is obviously illegitimate. And I can tell you that mainstream are giving up on these lies and they're now protecting the site. But they claim it's not important, but they're protecting it. What we have there <coughs> are two sets of writings. We have a story there of the two sons of Khufu, Nefer-Dejeb and Nefer-Teru, who sailed to Australia as emissaries. And you've got to understand something here. They didn't come here as some sort of great teachers to teach the poor blackfellas all the things they knew. It was the other way around. They came to learn. They originally landed somewhere near Wondandi, and I've heard more about this, and, and began a concord or treaty that started 4,660 years ago and continued to 400 years ago. During that time, there were always Egyptians in Australia. Now, the narrative we have there, very important because the first, first passage has got an 88% link to Proto-Egyptian. And we have the manual of the first person who found this, Ray Johnson, and he worked with Dr. Abu Diagazi from the Egyptian Antiquities Library. She was the president or the head of it. And they worked on the fact that the first panel was Proto-Egyptian, which is the oldest form of Egyptian. We have no problems with that. They are right. And in it, it gives you the name Nefer-Dejeb in one of the cartouches, which is done as a square cartouche. And it tells us about the ships being wrecked and that one of the brothers went west two seasons and was bitten by a snake twice and died. That was written on there. And we've got no issue with that. But what people haven't quite worked out is the next two panels. Because we went through the next two panels and the match to Proto-Egyptian was less than 50%. So there are more glyphs there that are not Proto-Egyptian than are. And then it became obvious to me when one of the elders told me, you do realise that they learnt their writing from us and we already wrote. Once the elders told me that, I thought, oh, now I'm getting somewhere, now I understand what's going on there. So I carry on. There are two sets of glyphs. There's the Egyptian story about the boats coming. Then there is a much older story about different vehicles coming to this planet. 
And it's when much do these more actually specific. date from, Stephen? Are you talking about two different time periods here? Yes. Or are you talking yes. about a story that was conflated? Yes. Sorry. Yeah, I, look, if you look at the two, the three yeah. walls, you will look at the three walls and say that first wall is done differently. And it was done differently. It was done by the Egyptians. The other walls were not done by them. And by the way, we have found other sets of glyphs away from those walls. And the claim has always been that the deranged Czech or the Sydney Uni students just did the walls. We have other sets of glyphs that talk about the glyphs and the walls there and point towards them. No, no, this wasn't done by some deranged person or some drunk students. This goes way back. Now, what's fascinating is when you look at the other two walls, there is no Egyptian god there. There's no talk of Nefertiri or Nefertigeb or anyone else or Khufu or anything. It's all about the beginning. It is basically a story about the genesis of humanity. And ladies and gentlemen, the glyph that appears the most there, which is not in any other form of writing, is what is called in Australia by the people who've all seen it as the UFO glyphs. And there are eight of them. They're all found in the second and third wall. So what we're saying very simply is, yes, by all means, there is the evidence of the Egyptians there. Now, some people are going to say, how can you prove that's actually Egyptian? And that's a fair call, isn't it? Because I just said it. The yeah. elders said it, but it's the proof. That's not enough, is it? That wouldn't do. Well, the trick was when Arnie Minnie Mace and Ray Johnson went there the very first time, Arnie Minnie, the original elder, picked up two artifacts. One was a bone and one was a piece of jewellery. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we took the bone to a base hospital and they put it through a CAT scan and they told me it has exactly the same density as a bone and it's ancient but they don't know where it is past that point. So that's a clue. It's an ancient bone that was found near the shaft and right next to the list. But the second piece of information we got, or second artifact, was jewellery. And we've had that analysed by one of the top laboratories in the country. And ladies and gentlemen, the Egyptian jewellery is made up of 73% aluminium, 3% copper, and 24% metals that they cannot identify and they've done four tests on them. They don't know what they are. Now, I'm going to let you in a secret. Egyptians never smelted bauxite with 3,700 degrees to turn it into aluminium. So we've got a question here. We've got an artifact here that's made from an incredibly modern process, and then we've got 24% of the metals there, or content there, that the top laboratory in this country cannot identify. And at the moment, we still have a question mark about that artifact. So, oh God, the Egyptians were there, but there's clues and indications that there's something that goes back even further and perhaps tells us why the Egyptians were sailing to Australia for over 4,000 years. That's really interesting. And we, we obviously, we've seen the carry-on glyphs. I've just been showing them after, in that section. And... You worked and know this guy, Laird Scranton. Who, yes. Who's, I think you should go into him for a bit because yeah, he kind from, of was, was a big help in decoding all this, wasn't he? He was because he proved to us what we thought. See, what he found was the very first marker on the second wall is a stick man. Now, I can tell you now, I've been through every form of Egyptology. They do not do stick. They don't do two sticks for the arms, two sticks for the leg, the whole thing. But Laird has been working, as you know, and trying to chase up the first language, which we believe exists and we believe we've got part of that anyway. What he told us was that stick man is called Marti in the first language and it has three particular meanings. It means black man, the beginning, and serpent. Well, the original people have the serpent as the major icon in their, in their stories this is a narrative about the beginning of humanity and it's about a black man. So we looked at that and we thought, my God, that's exactly the same thing. But then we went further because um, Laird is into the sacred language uh, through the Dogon. Now, what's fascinating... Now, that's just for, for yeah. people who may not be familiar with the Dogon. They're, they're actually an African tribe, aren't they? 
Yes, they are, and they have complete knowledge of Sirius A and Sirius B, and they know of they know of uh, they know of suns that rotate out in the constellations that we only just discovered because they're so damn small, no one could see them. They know of information they shouldn't know. Now, what's fascinating is that this particular site we're talking about is is called Bambara. And did you know that the neighbouring tribe to the Dogon called the Bambara? And if you go to um, Wikipedia, you'll find two entries for Bambara. One is Gosford, and the second one is the neighbouring tribe to the Dogon. So don't think there isn't a relationship there, because there is. But what we also found is when we looked at the glyphs with Laird's take, putting the Dogon and ancient sacred Egyptian stuff in there, this becomes a different story again. It now becomes a story of science pure science of breaking, of bending waves, of gravitation, of um, different bodies meeting one another and creating things. It's like a scientific story of what took place and it takes on a different level. And I do believe that this narrative we have is done at different levels. I believe what Lab was hitting was the spiritual level of this, the deepest level. Remember I said at the start that original stories are given at different levels for people according to what they know. Well, I believe Lab was hitting into the, the elders' level, the, the Kadija men's level, the, the secret level, when he started to talk about the science that was taking place there and the laboratories that were taking place there. Now, if you think that's a rather bizarre call, I will, I'd like to um, talk about that stick man. There are, just past the stick man, there's what seems to be the creation of humanity. And it starts with just the body. Right, and it's got a head, but it's got no legs and no arms. And then the next one has got legs and arms. And then the next one, the arms is handing out, and each of them holds a pyramid. And next to that, I've got a symbol, which means you split the DNA in half. And next to that, I've got father that creates something. And then a laboratory, and then the beginning of all things. And you look around this particular area there, and you say to yourself, "This is the beginning of humanity." But the fascinating part is humanity is a three-part process. It keeps growing and getting bigger like it's being made. And next to the middle of it, we've got the symbol for DNA with a shaft going straight through the center, splitting it in half. And I'm thinking, these guys are trying awful hard to tell us a story here. And of course, we still don't pick it up. What we think is on those walls is the creation of humanity. And I'm going to tell you this. It's a creation of humanity through the utilization of our genes and the involvement of another group and it's pretty obviously the other group are they came from the stars that's what that story is about well that's fascinating because obviously this goes into biblical stories pre-biblical stories and stories from all around the world and of course this genetic modification seems to be there in Homo sapiens sapiens and the late Lloyd Pye was really onto something with what he was doing and I don't know whether he was even aware of your work but it goes into what you were talking about this off planetary influence that came down and it's in every culture it's undeniable and and people can look that up you know it's in pretty much every culture around the world so What's interesting about this is that the the Australian culture, the ancient Australian culture, is extremely old, isn't it? It's not only old, but it's interesting because Graham Hancock, we spent about six days on country with him, and Graham's not a great fan of the UFO story. He feels like it undervalues uh, humanity's um, contribution there. And there's something in there. Um, that, yeah, it look, it works like this. He didn't really take much. He's been to other places that now I can't see that. But he started to un actually start to accept the Pleiadian story for a completely different reason. It's not because any elder said, oh, that was made by aliens or that was made by aliens. They never said that. And the ancient civilization was here. They're not claiming the aliens did. They said they made it. They did it and they gave it away. But what was obvious to Graham was, it was in their mythology everywhere. Every part of their mythology had Pleiades in it. I mean, in Australia, we have 500 different tribal nations with 500 different languages. It's not one language, ladies and gentlemen. You can't say Czechoslovakia and Germany are the same. Well, you can't say the same here. 
Each of these people had their own stories, their own mythology, their own ceremonies, but it doesn't matter whether I go to Port Hedland in West Australia, it doesn't matter where I go in this country, there is one dreaming story that is in every of every every tribal nation, and it's the seven sisters of the Pleiades. That story breaks every mold because it's everywhere and it's their focal story. It's the beginning of their life. And it's always the seven sisters of the Pleiades and the hunter Orion chasing the sisters. And sometimes she catches them, sometimes she doesn't. There can be variations within minor parts of the story, but the players stay the same. The elders would come up to Graham insistent and saying, do not forget Graham. My grandparents are Pleiadian. They would say our countrymen are Pleiadian. They wouldn't say their visitors. They call them countrymen. And this became such a common part of Graham's dealing with the elders. He started to realise they're either all lying, they're either all fools or they're telling the truth. And he never called them liars and he never thought they were fools. So it's different in this country because it's like when my, my elder that just passed on told me, when you go to a sacred place, he said there's a three rule. And if you don't get three, walk away. First of all, they have to show you the site. Secondly, they have to give you the story. And thirdly, they must find a constellation that site belongs to. And if they can't name one, it's a lie. So you've got a country here where they're supposed to be ignorant of everything, yet they tell you if it doesn't have a link to a constellation, it cannot be sacred. So they've got an obsession with what's called, oh, they say it every day, as on top, so below. But it's never so below as on top. It's always as on top first, so below second. They all tell me, every original person has told me, it's all ever here now, they want to talk about the Pleiadians. It's all they want to talk about. And they tell us, the Pleiadians, and they've got a story with this. They believe the Pleiadians seeded the whole of the planet. And they sent a spear, this is going back billions of years ago, and it wedged in the middle of Australia, and it's called Uluru. And if you look at Uluru, and if you look what's underneath, it's a three-mile spear that goes down to a point, and you're looking at the top there. Now, the story from the elders, and I'm thinking of Brendan, who's the lawman for Victoria, told this story. They placed all the, the, the stuff that makes life, the germs, the microbes, on that rock, and it spread. And they waited and waited until one species was their equal. And this is very important. People have got this idea that the aliens come here and there's some sort of greater, grander species and we're below them. No, that's not how it works here. The Pleiadians were looking for a species, a hominid, that they could incarnate into and share. And there's a beautiful line in the, um, in the gospel of a... I think it's no, the Apocalypse of Adam, the, the Gnostic Gospels, where Adam says to Seth that Eve taught us that we are greater than the gods that created us. And that was the plan here. The plan was take the best of out there, the Pleiades, and then take it with the best of here, which are the original people. And between that, you create something that's greater than the gods that created us. So there's the story there. That's what they tell us. This is something different here. The Pleiadians didn't want someone to work the gold mines. This probably happened elsewhere that did their bidding and did it without questioning. They wanted uh, a template that could make decisions on their own. And when they do the dreaming, they go off on their own and do it by themselves. So that's what this was about. It's a long-term plan that goes all the way back. We talked about this previously um, with reference to the Nag Hammadi scriptures, the rulers mould Adam, and there's some very strange lines in those Nag Hammadi scriptures which do hint at what you've just said. But bringing that constellation into it particularly is very interesting because obviously those are never mentioned in what we're given as the Nag Hammadi scriptures. But again, it takes us into areas which the mainstream will not go near so this is fascinating stuff and we're going to take another short break in your opinion do you think the jury was led it's not mine to say <laughs> very diplomatic tell the viewers a bit about what happened to you well they bribed uh 
three criminals to come in and give hearsay. If a bomb went off in London and took 92 lives, yeah, would you want to be on the payroll of that? It's um, all based on models and projections. It's all over bother shouting. In order to get me in prison, they probably broke, you know, a couple dozen laws. Free Yolanda. Y'all planted drugs on Yolanda, and we're going to get her released and get the crooked cops busted. That gave all the officers time for their adrenaline to, to slow down so we wouldn't get shot. Just for the viewers out there who may not know about this story, when did you discover this pyramid? In April of 2005, I first came to little Bosnian town of Visoko. When you drive someone to take their own life, like the CSA have done, I mean, that's an abomination. Thanks for being on Windows on the World. Peace to London. The rest is history. Everybody called me delirious after that. Welcome back to Windows on the World. I'm talking to Stephen Strong of ForgottenOrigins.com and we're having a very fascinating discussion here. Just during the break we were talking about where we come from and we were also talking about creatures that are indigenous to certain parts of the world and of course the kangaroo is pretty much an in indigenous creature from down under or Australia. So Stephen just Give us a bit of um, the background, what you were talking about there, yep. about this ancient story about kangaroos. Well, we actually, uh, I was shocked by this myself, and this sort of opened me up to a new area, because this is how this works with us. We think we know something, and then the oldest tells us something, and we'd start again. Well, what took place was um, there's a very highly respected elder down there now, taken over from Arnie Bev, the only person who can take the country on. His name is Gabby Duncan. And he was talking to um, an ancient aliens crew at the time. They didn't put this up, which is a bit of a shame, but that's what their decision was. He was look, pointing at the, the uh, engraving on the rock platform. And you've got this beautiful engraving of Bulgandry that some people call Thoth. That's who he is. And it was a story about him coming through the Milky Way. And beneath his bottom foot, there's a nine metre long canoe. It's the biggest canoe engraved on any rock platform anywhere in this country. And it's meant to be the spaceship that brought them here, the Sky Heroes. And I, I've got to make the point, ladies and gentlemen, the original people don't call it their, their people gods. They call them Sky Heroes. They come from the sky and they land and go up. Gabby said that. But what he also said was, he said, see those four animals wrapped around the Milky Way spaceship. And they are wallabies and kangaroos. And he said, they're not ours. And this really dig. I started to listen when this happened. He said, they came from the Pleiades. They brought them here. And when he said that, I thought to myself, the kangaroo is the only animal that can decide when it falls pregnant. It can hold a fetus for five years and then give it birth or abort it as it sees fit. It carries its young in a pouch. It has the best form of pregnancy on the, on the planet, ladies and gentlemen, particularly ladies. Two days after it's conceived, it crawls up to the the teat and stays there in a, in a pouch. That's got to be better than nine months given birth. It is so different from any other animal. And now, after hearing Gabby, and I know, if Gabby said this is true, this is what they know, the kangaroo is not. It doesn't belong to the earth. And then you start to wonder, you take the dingo that's found in Australia, that's our dog. Do you realise they did mitochondrial study on the dingo and they found it does not relate to any other wolf or dog, or subspecies of dog or wolf in the planet. It is not related to them. They've actually had to call a new animal. They've given a new species and a new category because it doesn't relate to any wolf, any dog in the planet. Uh, now, I've known Stephen, I don't think a lot of people would even know that. Oh, no, it's, it's true. The, that's Sydney really interesting because I, yeah. Yeah, the only reason I'd bring this up is that most people that I've well, most people I've ever met believe that the dingo is related to other breeds of dogs. It's not. It's not. It's not related. They did mitochondrial DNA. It. Well, I was told at uni it was related to a dog in the south of India, and that was done as done and dusted. Came here four thousand years ago, and I said, "Well, how? How did it get here?" How oh, people sail here? Say, "Hang on, but sick. That's not in the books. You told me cook came here, but then they didn't know what to do with it." But the problem is this. This was done by the top scientists in the country. Mitochondrial DNA we're talking about. We're not talking about looking at a dog and comparing it to another. They've gone inside the dog. They've now announced, and it was fascinating, what Sydney Uni said was, well, yes, it's not a dog. 
It's not a wolf. It doesn't relate to anyone else. We've, re- we've announced it now. We'll go, now go back to work and do our other stuff, and we won't follow that through. Why won't they follow it through? Because it doesn't make sense. If the dingo doesn't relate to any other dog on the planet, and never did, and by the way, it is the smartest dog on the planet. It's way smarter than any other dog. We all know that. And then there's a dreaming story about the fact that when everything was separated, the original people went one way, there was a big chasm, all the animals went the other way, and the dogs came with them, the dingoes came with them, and they regard them as being people. You realise if a woman loses a child, they are given a dingo pup to suckle. And the dingoes are allowed, you're not allowed to hit a dingo or even yell at a dingo because they're considered to be part people. So I always wondered why it was the dingoes separated from every other animal and related to us being part of that. Now it becomes obvious to me. It's not just the, the, the kangaroos and wallabies that were brought here, so is the dingo. And the reason we know this is because you, the scientists, can't find any other relation on the planet to the dingo. Therefore, my question is, if it's not related to anyone on the planet, where did it come from? And the answer must be, it can't be from this planet, because I don't have a relation on this planet, but it's here. So either the dingo just manifested itself one day out of nothing and appeared in Australia only and never went anywhere else. That's one theory. It's crap. Or the second theory is it is related to other animals, which is the theory we'd all agree with. But the problem is if you want to go down that line, then don't look on this planet because you won't find the answer. Now, the scientists have proved that. I'm not passing on an opinion. I'm passing on their work. The problem with their work is when they find stuff like this, when they hit a wall like this, and they do it nearly every day now, they throw the pens up in the air and they walk out the door and they don't come back again. And they leave it there. Just for people who are new to this information (laughs) and may not be really well versed in this the ancient Australia and the out of Australia theory rather than the out of Africa theory. Mm. Why do you think it is that academics within your own country have such a problem with it? Because people would be saying, well, surely this would be very good for Australia. No, it's not. It's not very good for Australia, unfortunately, Mark, for two reasons. It's not very good for the world in one reason and particularly poor for Australia in another. So let's do the global implications of this first. The global implications are this. There was a group of people, the very first people on this planet, that were chosen basically to lead the rest of us to an extent. They went down the path. You see, the Pleiadians and the Syrians and all the mob that came here, it's a mixed blessing. Even the Pleiadians, it was a mixed blessing. They gave us the genes that will actually, will eventually give us enlightenment. But they also gave us a curse, which was technology. Now, what we found is, the curse of technology um, has done this. It has made it so that this, this planet is not like any other planet in the cosmos. It does not run on technology. It runs on high spiritual octane fuel, and that's the way it's supposed to run. Now, the original people, they had embraced the Pleiadians. They embraced their genes, and, and after a while, they said, yeah, let's try all this modern stuff you've got, and they threw it away. They said, this does not work. This is not where this planet goes, and this is not our history. Now, if I can share with you, I want to explain why that's the case. Very recently, I was with Uncle Marbuck, a very, very wise man of the old way, and I asked him, I said, look, I get the fact that the Pleiadians and the Syrians and all this mob have come here, the Greys have been here and all this stuff. I said, but I don't get why. I said, honestly, I've looked at our history over the last five, 6,000 years, and Mark, I've got to tell you, it's appalling. It is people who've got wisdom are oppressed and killed or persecuted, and most of the time we're killing each other. And I said, well, what would, why would they want to come here? What would they gain from us? They have wisdom. What are they going to get? And he said to me, no, you're wrong. And I've been wrong many times with this stuff. I don't mind that. He said, no. He said, I want you to think of the aliens like Dr. Spock. Rationally knows everything, intellectually understands everything, compassion understands what's right and wrong, but has no emotion, has no emotion whatsoever. Dr. Spock could never work out Captain Kirk and that mob there. He said that wasn't an accident. He said this mob, the Pleiadians, all these different people here, they understand everything, but there's one emotion they run low on. It's love. It's the most powerful emotion there is. And he said the humans here, this planet is the most, the, the planet that can create. 
You can create Beethoven, Tchaikovsky, Muse. Yes, you can create music that's unbelievable. That can make art that's unbelievable. They can't do this stuff. We can also go the opposite way and wipe us out through genocide. They don't understand that either. But there's something within us. Why did the greys try and pull us apart time after time? They were trying to find that love-generating organ, and they couldn't find it. There is something in us. There's some capacity we have that they don't have. Yes, and it's very interesting, it, Stephen, because yeah. this is with the sort of research that when you get into this, these mm. off-planetary kind of drone-like creatures, they see us as containers because we contain something. And this goes back to something which is ancient mm. and it's almost ties in, I think, with this idea that souls have to incarnate into us. We're incarnated yes. with a soul, but there are people on this planet who haven't got souls because not everybody can be incarnated with a soul. And this, it's, it's a little bit abstract, but what we're seeing on this planet is a shutting down of creativity, mm -hmm. a shutting down of anything which resembles original thought and a drone mentality being implanted into the into everybody through education and through society and the way it's being engineered i mean we cover this a lot but it's not really off topic it's very profound because why do you think we're at a point now where we're seeing absolute tyranny on this planet and the lies are getting more ridiculous and they're getting harder to cover up, but the tyranny yeah. is on a massive scale. Why, why do you think that is? Because it was meant to happen. It was meant to happen as part of a, a cleansing process. You can't lance a boil until you can see it. You see, in this country, in Australia right now, we just had an election, and they did a survey before the election, and they found the Australian electorate are the most dis in, disengaged and the least trustful of politicians on the planet. 21% of the people voted and felt that it made a difference. 79% of the people in Australia said it makes no difference anymore. Politicians don't care about us anymore. That is a very positive attitude. Now, it's negative. It's negative because it's, it's lost. It's just I hate them all. But if, if something positive could come out of that and people could see there's a better way, then you've got a step a way of going forward. But you can't go forward until you can see the warts and the lance in front of you. And then it stinks. And that's what we're seeing now. So the original people, look, the reason why the last two years we have all these amazing sites and all this stuff that's been hidden and we haven't got it all is because they believe this is the last year for a decision, for each person to make a decision about where they want to be and where they're going to go. They believe after this year, if you don't decide correctly, you're done for. Now, they're not saying there's a date in the future where somebody's going to stand up in the sky and we're all going to see the answer. It's not going to be like that. And they, they're very cryptic about what's going to take place. But all of this stuff we're doing right now and the stuff you're talking about, everyone gets a choice. Everyone gets a choice right now. And, yes, there are people actively conspiring to keep that information quiet. But, you know, I've found that doesn't work for a long period of time. We've now got one of the top laboratories in the country and the scientists there working with us um, on work that they know the mainstream is going to hate they're doing it, but they're going to do it anyway. And see, what's happening is the people who are trying to stop this information can't do it anymore. They can't stop us anymore because it's coming out. It doesn't yeah, I think help. people are getting they fed have. up with it, you know, because they've overplayed their hand. This is, we talked about that just before the show, really, with what's happening here politically. But I also made a comment to you, which I think you agree with, is that, in Australia, it's probably worse than here, from what yes. I can see. It seems to be a very vicious establishment that you have there. Well, that's why we've got 79% of the people in this country now yeah. have no faith in their leaders. Now, when you don't have faith in your leaders and you think they lie to you and you don't trust them anymore, that's not how you steer a ship. You don't steer a ship when 80% of the crew don't want to be on the boat because that's when you get a mutiny. And that's what we've got at the moment. I noticed that, that in the voting intentions in the Senate, um, 
the two major powers parties got less than um, three quarters of the vote. And quite a few people now, every day more people are just giving up in politics. But they're also giving up on basically the whole system they're part of. They don't trust any of it anymore. So <clears throat> no, I'm not saying that all these people are enlightened and, and ready and meditating each day and, and see the, the change, but I actually I play a lot of tennis and hang around with mainstream people, and I'm quite surprised by how disheartened they've become and they don't believe, basically. They've got to the stage where if, if there's someone with a suit and tie on TV saying something, they're just thinking that guy's probably lying. That's so, a really good, that's a, it actually means we're at a very good point in history then. And uh, yeah. that is actually very encouraging. I know you've not got that much time left. So in the time that we've got today, could we go a, a bit into this latest find, this very yeah. strange artifact, this horse that's been found? And we're going to put the pictures up on the screen so people can see it. Give us a bit of a background of that, who found yeah. it, where and what and what it's made of. Well, this is a different one, guys, because um, before we were stumbling into ancient technology that was original and it was part of what humans did, this is the first time we stumbled into something where I'm not convinced this is human. Or even Graham, I'm going to have to say to Graham, this time I think we've got one. Now, and that's a pretty radical claim to make because I think this is the first time we've got proof of something that wasn't made by humans. Now, that's a pretty deadly thing to say, but let me explain why. This particular horse that we're talking about, it's not a horse because, honestly, it's not that. Um, we took it to the laboratory and the guy looked at it and we decided we're going to take five, five small holes. We're going to drill five holes into this thing to find out what is it made of. Now, it was fascinating. I told you this before in the talk. The guy got there. He put the first drill on top of on, inside on the inside and he put the drill on. He turned the drill on and it just slid down the side of the neck and just made this great big scar on the inside. The gentleman has had this artifact now for about four or five years, was nearly in tears because he loves it. It's like a child to him. I had to distract him and give him an artifact to hold and play with while they kept doing it. And what happened was the guy told us, I thought this was copper. It's not. They had to use a tungsten tip to actually drill into it. It is harder than iron, iron, iron ore. Now, here's the trick. Why did we dump copper? We dump copper because it's not strong enough, and we never found a way. We made brass, we made different alloys, bronze, but we couldn't make it hard. This is harder than steel. Now, that's a problem, a big problem. Secondly, copper, bronze, uh, brass, all alloys, they have five or six elements. They don't have 24. This has 24 different elements. Now, that begins to be a problem. Then when you look at the elements inside, and we've got the readout, we've been given it, molybdenum, boron, barium, vanadium. Now, ladies and gentlemen, most of you mob probably don't even know some of those things because I'll tell you now, some of them are only just being used in control reactors, super magnets, all sorts of stuff like this. Now, what we did find was, A, take barium, never been placed in cop any copper alloy ever. But it is here, only place in the world. Is there a signature like this anywhere in the world? No, there is not. But of those 24 elements we've found so far, and we haven't found them all, and I'll tell you something else about this too that's even more amazing, of those 24, 19 are conductors, and we have the top five superconductors. Now, what are they doing in there? This stuff also... Harder than steel. It's got vanadium in there. The first time we used vanadium, was the Germans used it in the Second World War to make a cannon called the Big Bertha so it wouldn't break. This thing, you can't bend it. You would, you, whatever you want to do to it, it's still perfectly straight today and it's been underneath the surface sitting in the wet soil. It will never oxidize. It's got chemicals in there. It's got the best preventers of oxidization in the world there also. The elements that have been placed in there there are at least six of them we've only been using for the last 30 years. We never used them before. When Captain Cook came here, half the elements on that bloody horse were not thought of or known. So my question is, somebody said it's just a plant. You mean someone's found a way of making copper harder than steel and they've thrown it on the ground? That would be the dumbest person on the planet because they could make billions, couldn't they? This is harder than steel. You can't drill. Only the tungsten tip or a diamond tip will break it. Now, what's even more fascinating is this. 
And there's more to it. They took five readings. Now, the four from the inside, I saw what colour they came up. I was in the laboratory. And then they took one from the surface. And do you know what? The one from the surface is not the same. It's a different chemical makeup again. The colour was different. So we've got an artefact there that's ancient, made of copper, that is made of two different chemical combinations within the same thing. So what we've got is a machine, a machine that conducts or creates or stores energy. And it's one half of a machine because it's clipped together. It's actually another part of a horse, but the other part is it's not a horse. It doesn't look a thing like a horse. It's not a llama. It's not anything. There's no animal or structure like this in the world. So is it, it just look like, like a composite animal, like a, a chimera, yeah, which yeah, um, they have now, on the gates. They have these, these um, things called, they call them chimera, which are basically a composite of different animals, really, almost yeah. looking like some kind of genetically modified strange creature uh, on yes, the gates of Babylon, perfect. you know. Mm. And, yeah, it, it, it is horse-like. Um, it is horse-like, but the neck is too long, yes. and we've got no mane, we've got no tail, we've got no ears, and then it looks a bit like a llama. And, of course, here's the trick. Vanadium is only found in Chile. There's only one deposit. Of, there's none in Australia. Molybdenum is not found in Australia, but you can find it in South America. And we actually chased up the elements there. 21 of them can be found in South America, and 12 can be found in Australia. So 12 out of 24. Where do I get the other 12 from? There are so many questions with this particular artifact that don't make sense. But what I can't find is I can't find a signature on this planet. Now, that's the important part of this story, ladies and gentlemen. It is thousands of years old. And by the way, if you think this guy has set this up and he's made this up as a, as, a, as a way of getting publicity, I have seen all the paperwork when he went to the museums and all the authorities in Australia. He begged them to look at it. Now, you do realise if they came onto his place and found that and found the other stuff that's there, because there's more, they can take his property. They can take it off him and second it and say, no, this is a national treasure now. You can leave. We'll look after it. So if you're telling me he's doing this for some sort of reason, that was dumb. They could have taken his property from him and, and said, okay, this is ours now. He was doing this to try and find the truth. And after he'd been to every organisation in Australia that's official, and they all told him, Fascinating. Well, but we don't do this one. Go to someone else. You go to someone else. Oh, that's very interesting. You go off to those people. Finally, he came and saw us. Now, he was not trying to get any publicity, and he doesn't want his place known. He doesn't want him known. He doesn't want anything from it. He doesn't want money. He wants the truth. And the government wouldn't give it to him. So we are. And the truth is this. No signature in the world like this. A combination of elements that I don't think we can still do today. It is the hardest metal I've seen, harder than steel, but it's copper. It's a superconductor. It's heat resistant to the stage where you can put in a nuclear reactor and it will not melt. It's an amazing piece of metal that we have never made before. So who made it? It's That's really, my question. It's really interesting, Stephen, because it looks as though it's got some sort of bridle on it, as though it was it's used or something. It looks like somebody could have sit on it because it's got a, it's it's got a kind of saddle. Oh yeah, it's got it. it's got it's got a strap underneath the saddle. And a strap it's got, underneath it. Like, and it's got a saddle cloth and it's got design on it and it's worn, isn't it? It's been rubbed away. But then the surface of it is glowing. You can put it in the dark. I think even and from the photograph, close. you can see how hard that is. You know, well, it looks like something that is pretty much unbreakable. It is unbreakable. Look, at they laid, the, the, the scientists laid it flat on a piece of glass. And do you realise there's not a kink on it? It's 180 degrees all the way along, and they could not believe it just sat. Whole of, the, um, whole of the object sat neat against the glass, and they looked all the way around. It is perfectly straight, and it's been sitting in the dirt for centuries. Look, you pick up a tin can and put it in a place that gets four to 5,000 mils a year. Right, and then pick up that tin can five years from now and have a look at it. You lost most of it; it's gone. I don't care what you can put anything that we've made and put it in a place like that, and you'll get corrosion, you'll get wear. 
This one doesn't wear, it doesn't corrode, it doesn't bend, it doesn't do anything. And you know what? If you want to drill into it, get a tungsten tip or a diamond tip because nothing else will harm the damn thing. You should have seen the look on this guy's face too because he was so embarrassed. Like, you can't even drill properly. And I've got to tell you, the boss scientist wasn't very impressed to begin with either. Until they worked out this thing was so damn hard, he didn't look happy with the young lad. But the reason, he they were doing science, man. They just assumed it was copper. It's not copper. It's not brass, it's not bronze. I don't know what you're going to call it, but you're going to have to call it something new. It has to be given a new name because no one's made this before. And that's my point, Mark. Yes. No one's made it before. So if no one's ever made it before, and, oh, if it's a fake, please, that guy should be, <laughs> I mean, if he's made something that makes copper harder than steel, man, he said, I mean, there's silver in there, for God's sake. Why do you put silver inside a toy? Because it's a fantastic conductor. That's why it's there, because every decent conductor of electricity and power has to be inside that thing. So my question is, what is it for? And since it's thousands of years old, I am having trouble, even knowing how advanced the civilizations were here before. And I'm going to tell you, the technology they had in an earlier time, I've got other stuff here we won't talk about today where the scientists said, we can't do this today either. Uh, the rocks we've got, these guys were saying, this is outrageous. I, I don't know how we could do this. I don't know. I can't envisage how we could do what they've got there. So we're going to have to accept the fact that we're going backwards, guys. We have fallen into a screaming heap. And I really think this is as bad as it's ever got. I don't think we've ever been in a worse situation than we have been now. This is like the end of the road. You were saying before that they're, they're, they don't hide it anymore. They don't. Everything's falling apart, and it's never been worse. Atlantis and Lemuria would have gone down a century ago down this path, but we stayed longer, I think, because we've finally got to sort this out. And I yeah. think that halts, whatever it is, is a reminder, and I think this is why it's been found now, that, yeah, we've done a lot. But there's another group involved in this, and they're watching us. And they're just outside the planet thinking, for God's sake, get it right. Yeah, it's, it's, this is really fascinating stuff, because I, I think this is probably the most anomalous artifact you've ever found it, that, yeah. I've, that I've reported on anyway. I mean, I know this, you've got a, a lot more on your site now, ForgottenOrigin.com, but this is something that people would have real difficulty in believing came out of Australia because it's it could possibly tie into what we're told in a conventional timeline to things like Sumeria you mm -hmm. know which is only 6,000 years but mm. it doesn't fit in at all with what people would expect of ancient Australian culture does it really no, it doesn't. Remember, it was found beneath the surface, which means someone didn't walk past and drop it. And here's the point. What moron on the planet carrying something that was made with that technology would drop the thing? My I God, think we brought this up about a year ago. I was having a bit of a laugh about that, that something was found that someone, they were stating in the official storyline that somebody brought it over from Africa and dropped it. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that was the, uh, the Ross's Rock one where they said that someone brought it from Africa and dropped walked through the countryside and dropped it and didn't realise it and it weighs over a kilo. Yeah, I, it's <laughs> yes. funny, I dropped those rocks that we've got. I had a gentleman out here yesterday and I said, you realise these rocks are so strong that we can't cut them today? He said, really? And I accidentally dropped one of them on concrete. And he cringed and I did a bit too and then we picked the rock up after we dropped it on concrete. And it's been cut, as you know, we've got these fine cuts in there. And do you know what? I dropped the rock on concrete. It did not make a chip on it. These guys have baked stuff. I mean, there's, there's technology in Australia, and it's not just Australia, it's through the whole of the world. You see that rock I just spoke about, the one we dropped? There are marks on there, angles on there. You know, Lair was talking about the first language. Yes. Well, the Bosnian Pyramid, Dr. Samir contacted us. Samir, and they found Osman a rock. Ogic, yes, I, I speak to him yeah, quite yeah. regularly, yeah. Well, he'll tell you about this too. They found a rock in the tunnel there and had 15 angles on it. I thought, oh my God, those angles look similar. So we got them measured, and of the 15 angles, all 15 angles can be found on the one we've got in Australia. 
Well, that's we really look... interesting. I'm going to put that on the screen there, Stephen, so people can see. Yeah. We discussed this about 18 months ago, and these are rocks that are extremely hard, that are extremely ancient, which have two types of striations, which look as though they could really have only been done with kind of machine tools, really. Cut, cut. Yes. But a new rock just came in from Germany about a month ago, brand new. We didn't know about it. And it's really ancient, and they've got 11 angles on that, marked them out, and guess what? All 11 are on this rock in Australia. Now, I'm suggesting Laird's right. When he says there's an ancient language, if you can find a rock in Canada that's got 19 out of 21 angles we've got, you can find a rock in Bosnia that's got 15 out of 15, and you've got one in Germany that's got 11 out of 11, don't tell me nature did that. Tell me that we did that, and tell me that we were actually in communication with people all over the world because we have America, Australia, and Europe with rocks that are exactly the same with the same angles. So when we think that we're just starting to begin to make an international community today, no, we're not. We did it before, and we did it much better. And then what happened was we got caught up with technology, and then we threw it away. And everyone lived in the, under the auspices of the dream until about 7,000 years ago where we started to walk down that same familiar path. And look where we are today. We did it again. Yeah, we went backwards, which we is went a real shame. And yeah. the real problem we've got is that the academic world think we've gone forwards. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Look, we, just, we did a translation of the Standing Stone site, and it starts with welcome to the pillars of heaven. And then it goes in there, and it's so erudite and so spiritual. And then I walk down the street today and I listen to the kids in the high school that I used to teach and every third word they use is the word like and I'm thinking, yes, we've gone forward. We really are doing much better now than before. We're nowhere near the pillars of heaven, that's for damn sure. Well, absolutely, and vocabulary has gone down to that. I was going down the road like, I saw this like, and then I thought that like, and then did this like. And <laughs> you think to yourself, <laughs> how did it come to this? when it, we'd, we had a much larger vocabulary than this 200 years ago and obviously a much larger one <laughs> hundreds of thousands of years ago from the evidence that you and other people in the world are bringing forward. Um, it's absolutely amazing because people don't realise that, you know, even ancient cultures like the Vikings learned from previous cultures. The Vikings were meant to be great navigators, but they learned it from previous civilizations. That's the point. The Egyptians were the ones who tried to catch most of that old civilization back. That's why they came to Australia, because they were looking for the past. And that's the whole point of this exercise, ladies and gentlemen. Why did the sons of the pharaohs come to Australia. It's a dangerous journey. I mean, a lot of people die when they take these trips. I mean, we know how they got there. They, they surfed the Roaring Forties. They went down the coast of Africa, turned and faced Australia when the wind was blowing the right way and got blown across to Australia. We know how they did it. We know all of that. But the question that people have got to realise is they came here and they're obsessed with the stars too, aren't they? They have everything pointing up, don't they? Just like the original people because they learnt that we are not global citizens, but we're actually galactic citizens, and we've got to work that out. We're not yes. just from Earth. That's the trick here, ladies and gentlemen. We have to work out we're part of an international universal community, and the worst part of this story is, if anyone ever saw the show Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, yes. remember that the computer, the answer to the air, the the meaning of life was found on the earth before they turned it into a super highway, whatever. But this was the place, even in that fictional story, where the meaning to life was supposed to be found. Well, you know, it's funny. Fiction can be stranger than truth, and sometimes it can be the truth. And I think that that story and the Dr. Spock story about the first alien, it's funny how these little stories we get in fiction have that grain of truth. Maybe these guys were given that information just to sort of put it into the mainstream sort of thinking. Well, we know so that they, in more recent times that um, these ideas that came in in the 50s and 60s through sci-fi and even into the 80s are all happening now and they have been happening for quite some time. So... 
there is an agenda going on. I mean, the thing is that we are having our society re-engineered. We have change agents put in our society, which we cover on our show a lot. So we are being controlled, and that's a fact. It's not just some big conspiracy theory. So what we're trying to do here is give people a little glimpse into a new reality, which, as you've said tonight, mm. is getting more and more exposed to more and more people. Yes, it is. It's becoming stronger. Uh, we're doing a talk in Adelaide next week, and we're hoping hundreds turn up, and it's going to be the same story again. The, the idea is if hundreds turn up, which they probably will, and they hear the truth, they go home and they tell others. And you can't stop that. You can't stop good news running through the community because people want good news. They're sick of bad news. So what we're going to tell them is that this is all a good story because we look upon this time as not negative but positive because you can't change something until you are aware of the fact that it needs to be changed. And that's what this is about. This is a change time for each person. And the elders have made this clear that all this information we're getting and others are getting we're getting it because the spirits want us to have that information and they want everyone to understand that you have to make a decision. Each person that's listening to your show now, if you don't sign up and join the Greens or join a political party or join anything, you have to sign yourself up and you have to make a commitment to what is the truth. And the truth is not what we're told. The truth is, according to the original people and according to the Pleiadians and according to our history, we were supposed to be the sadhus, the teachers of them. We were supposed to lead them towards their spiritual salvation. Yeah, they've got the machines. They've done that back to front. The greys in particular have now become impotent because they've become so involved in their science now they can't keep themselves going except through cloning. They're desperate for that wisdom and they have a little bit of it but not enough. They all have a little bit but only it's only us, only us that can do the, the big step like disappear, like I told you before, with an elder, or talk to the animals, or walk through a tree, or levitate. That is something, that is something we alone can do, and they want to learn. And the problem is that while we're being dumbed down and cleared out like this, we can't learn it ourselves. Now, how can we teach anyone if we've, we've forgotten ourselves? But I do know, and Kato told me this, he said, the stuff that we're dealing with came from a time when we had more genes. What he meant by that is not that we had more genes, it's just that we're using them all. And yes, that's that goes into the DNA, doesn't it? And the, the that is it. Junk it's a salvation. Yeah. yeah. The, the aliens gave us, the, when the original people sailed to the rest of the world, they didn't want to leave their land. They didn't want to go. They were made to go. And what they did was they were made to export their sperm, their ovum, and their genes to other places so that every person within them as the Pleiadian genes, which are the ones that will save you, and there's other genes in there that won't save you. And now you've got to work out which ones to use. That's exactly. what this is about. Pick um, the pat. Yeah, they're trying to re-engineer us in many ways, and that's a very big subject, but it is happening. And it's not just your mind that they're after. It's yeah. also a genetic thing and the way we are being changed genetically. That's, that's something for another show, though. But I think this has been really fascinating, Stephen, because we've gone into areas which we haven't really touched before, and that was the idea, but also to make it rather broader than some of the other interviews we've done in the respect that it, giving a bit of background and a bit of the background to, to how you got into it and, and where it's going now. And I think this has been really good. And I'd, uh, maybe everyone can go to your website, ForgottenOrigin.com, catch up with what's happening because you've collated an enormous amount of information and anomalous artifacts with some some very well respected people, including Klaus Donner, obviously Led Scranton, and and many others. So mm. I would. Uh, yeah, suggest that everybody looks at the ancient Australia, Stephen and Evan Strong, and give us give us some titles of some of your books as well, because you've you've done quite a number of books, haven't you? Yeah, we have. We've done a few of them. I mean, we've got one at the moment. Our most most recent one is Between a Rock and a Hard Place, but our books will be changed soon because Hampton Road are taking over them now, which is really important for us. 
Um, and one of our books shunned. It's it's still around, but it'll be around for another couple of months, and then no longer is for sale because they're taking over that one. But between a rock and a hard place, we still have copies of that, and we're allowed to sell them till the end of the year. And then they have an option on that one too, and then we lose that one also. So yes, we still can get them at the moment. They'll be in a different form further on down the line. Um, between a rock and a hard place, we basically work on the sacred stones we've been working on, which we mentioned one of them, and also that wonderful place, um, the Standing Stone site. Um, and that's another story again, which we can't talk about today, but we primarily focused on that. And then we gave a conclusion for the first time and we threw in the alien part of the story. We've been sort of sitting back on that a bit and we showed us why they've been part of this equation. So, yeah, we're still working on it. And it's a funny story because, honestly, we don't know where this takes us because the elders are sitting on stuff now. They've told us we've got stuff that makes the stuff you've got now look third rate. I said, oh, great. And I know one of them. I nearly got to see one, which would be, it would be in every newspaper and every TV station in the world. And then they pulled up at the last moment, but it'll come. There's more to come out of this country. It was the beginning place. It was the last place to be settled again, and it'll be the first place to be resettled the old way. Well, that's a really good place to leave it for today, and there's a lot to, for people to think about. Um, we're going to get back in touch with you soon, and you were even in the Daily Mail in the UK and that's what you were just referring to. I so, spurred up press for that. It's quite that's funny. Right, but and I've got spurred up press who approached us a couple of days ago and want to cover us again. And I keep thinking, isn't that a wonderful way to get out through mainstream, through the Murdoch press? And I'm thinking, yeah, that works for me. It works for me. <laughs> well, if it yeah. works for you, do it, because we need every outlet we can get. And um, we'll go into that Daily Mail story maybe next time, but people can find it online. What? It's about an ancient stone circle that was found in Australia, and you've been doing some more work on that. It was through Frederick Slater in the 30s and 40s. I think we touched yeah. on it slightly tonight, but until next time, thanks very much for being on, Stephen, and say hello to Evan, because I know he couldn't be with us tonight. And he will speak be to you. Back, sure. Yeah, we'll speak to you very soon. Beautiful, mate. Thanks again for talking. Lovely to talk to you as always, Mark. Good fun. Thanks, Stephen. Pleasure.